Crossroads family. Listen, I'm gonna ask you to say something with me. We're gonna say we are family. You ready? One, two, three. We are family. That is who we are. That was loud and proud. I love that. If you're here in East Hartford, you wanna to stand to your feet. My name is Sterling, I'm the East Hartford Campus Pastor. If you're joining us online, let us know you're there. Drop a line, say we are family, and this is the family that's represented. This is who we are. I have to tell you, we have some great things coming up. We have an annual church business meeting. And if you say, what is that, Jamal? What, what is that annual church business meeting? This is an opportunity for you to come and hear God's praises. And you say, what does that mean? Look around us. God is moving. You're gonna be able to hear how, how through God's testimony and His goodness, through your faithfulness and giving, we have continued to love people. And so if you're, if you're a member, you can come. If you're a non-member, you can be here to observe as well. So we wanna encourage you, be a part of that. We are family. Did you, did you kind of feel when you were pulling in, we had our young adults out there, some of our young adults, did you feel that a little bit? Feel some of that love, that excitement, that energy? Part of that we are family is there's just something about serving. There's something about getting in. I'll say, Mr. Card, he has been jumping in our cafe and he's been saying, let's get this going. He goes, I gotta get jazz in here. We gotta get our lattes going. And we need that energy. We need that excitement because that's who we are. We are crossroads. We are family. And so after service, oh, I just saw Ryan Gagnon, brother. Oh, you guys, the Gagnon family, y'all are so awesome. We are family. Stop at Connection Point. You're gonna see some balloons out there. Don't pop them, all right? We need them for tomorrow. But you're gonna stop out, and Kendra and I are gonna be out there. We're gonna have some other volunteers. We wanna meet you. We wanna talk to you. We wanna help you find your place in this family. Isn't God good? There is a reason to worship, amen? If you've come in this place and you're saying, I don't know what my reason is, take the focus off you and put it on him. Did you hear that? There is a reason, family, to worship, amen? Let's worship today. He is good. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for this family, for the body of Christ. You are good. You are good. Can you say that? You are good. In every circumstance, every situation, today, you are good. Let's worship, church. Amen. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord. It is so wonderful to worship with you all. Let's clap our hands and let's lift up the King of Kings. Amen. Let it be known that our God saves our God reigns. We lift you up, up. Let it be known that love has come, love has won. We lift you up. Whoa.
such a great God. He reigns forever. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we believe every word that he says.
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor, may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family. you up. Let's just give him a hand clap of praise. Let's shout his name and just give him all the glory and the honor. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We lift you up. We praise you. Worthy of honor, glory, power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, it is wonderful to be worshiping with you in the house of the Lord. Please be seated. What if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful, 
a love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger, a love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better? Well, good evening, Crossroads family. There's a lot of energy tonight, huh? What do you think? Feel good? Yeah? You know, the words of that video, I, I just think um, that's what our world needs today. It, it's been around a long time. There's a lot of songs that have come through the years that have said what the world needs now is love, right? Uh, some, some of the misunderstanding is what kind of love and how that all looks like, but, but Jesus has the answer for us. Listen, if you have your Bible with you this evening, uh, whether it's paperback or digital or whatever it is, I want to encourage you to take it and open to John chapter 9. We're going to put some of the verses that we get to here in a bit um, up on the screen, but if you have your Bible, get it. I'm, I'm not going to cover the whole little sections of what we're talking about, and so you might want to look around there just a little bit. Uh, but John chapter 9, we're going to get to John chapter 9 in just a second. Over the last several weeks, we've been focusing on how Scripture tells us that we can love people in the very best way, in the way that changes their life in the here and now, and also changes their eternity. That is, it's a way that helps take care of them beyond this life, what what a gift. What, what, what kind of a gift can you give that is, that is more than that? And as we've talked about that kind of love, we've talked about Jesus' love, we said that Jesus' priority is people. Say people. He is focused on people. And very specifically, he is focused on people's potential. He's focused on everybody's potential. He's focused on your potential. He's not focused on their current status in life, however they are right now, right? But he's focused on their potential. Jesus is focused on the potential of saving them from their sins. And he's focused on the potential of using them in his ministry in order to share love and grace with everybody that's around them. And so every person today, that includes you, that encourages the per person next to you, the person behind you, the person that you run into uh, this week. Everyone has value to God, and Jesus' priority is people. We also talked about the fact it, that in this process, it's vital for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, who have, who, who have the gift of his spirit living within us, it's vital to us that, that we are full of his spirit, full to overflowing uh, with, with, with his spirit. It is God's spirit that gives us the power to see others the way Jesus sees them. When we don't have his spirit living within us uh, uh, and, and to an overflowing place, it's much more natural for us to look at people in their current state and be irritated with them. It's okay to be honest about that because they're irritated with you too, right? Yeah. Why? Because we're people and we are filled with problems. But it's having the Spirit of God within us and filling us to overflowing that helps us to see people the way Jesus sees people in their potential. God's Spirit filling us also gives us the courage to move forward and and do things that we need to do in love, to know the right things to say, to know the right things to do, and to understand the right time to do them and the not so right time to do them. We talked about the fact that being filled with God's spirit to overflowing is not a one-time thing. It's something that we need to seek after continually, daily. It's not something that happens and then, and then you, don't have to, you, know, either, you don't have to think about it again because you're filled to overflowing. The Bible tells us that God's spirit, God wants to fill us over and over and over again to, a, to an overflowing place. And finally, 
We talked about the practical application side of all of this for us and in our loving other people. We love people like Jesus loved them in this way when we, one, develop real friendships, authentic friendships with people who are far away from God. When we spend time to really get to know them, who they are, what they're going through in life, what their plans and ambitions are, and we love them for who they are. And then we, we said there's one more practical step. That is, figure out the next step. You say, what's the next step? I don't know. I don't know. It's gonna be different in every single person's life. It's gonna look different in each situation. Uh, every person that you meet, the next step in that relationship is gonna be different. But the next step does involve in some way helping them come to know Jesus Christ. That is, just staying friends with them, which is what many of us do, is not enough. If we're going to love them with God's grace, if we're going to love them and be concerned about their eternity, then we've got to take a next step that goes deeper even than friendship. And let's be really honest for just a minute. This can be a pretty scary idea because we don't know how they're gonna react. We don't know how they're gonna respond. And so figuring out that next step can be filled with all kinds of potential pitfalls and you know what and where and how and what, how are, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't understand, right? So to get into the practice of this next step thing, and we, there's so many directions we could go, but in the time we have, I wanna walk through two short stories from the Bible that I think can help us in, in thinking through and walking through uh, this practice about what is the next step in somebody's life if we're gonna love them in this way. So the first one's found in John chapter nine. That's why I had you turn there. In John chapter nine, there's a story, and we're not gonna read the whole story. It's mostly the whole chapter there, where Jesus encounters a man who was blind from the time of his birth. That is, he was born blind. He didn't become blind. He was born blind. And events transpire in this story, and in the end, Jesus chooses to heal this man, to make it so that he can see again. That's, that's what the story is all about, right? He, he does this, he performs this healing in, in a kind of unique and maybe even weird way. He, he gets some dirt, he spits in the dirt, he makes mud out of the dirt, and then he takes the mud and he puts it on this blind man's eyes, and he tells him to go off and find this pool of water and wash the mud off. Now, Jesus isn't gonna be there when the mud gets washed off, but he says, just, you know, trust me, go wash it off, and, and, and it really doesn't even say, he says, this is what's gonna happen when you do it. And I'm thinking, the guy didn't even need to hear him say, go wash the mud off. He's probably gonna go and try to wash the mud off, right? But he follows what Jesus says. Well, sure enough, the guy goes and he washes his, off the mud in this pool that Jesus has told him to, and now suddenly he can see. Is it technicolor? I don't know. I don't know what it is. But he can see. Word gets out and people start to question this man about Jesus and what Jesus has done for his life. Because you see, uh, there's a lot of people around who, who aren't fans of Jesus and they don't want people following Jesus and they don't want this story of Jesus healing somebody from being blind. They don't want that, that kind of a big miracle to get out and then other people be on Jesus' side. So they gotta find a way to discredit him and so they start questioning him. John chapter nine, verse eight says this. The neighbors, how many... How many of you have neighbors that always know what's going on? <laughs> that can be a good thing today. <laughs> you say, I've got ring, I don't need a neighbor. Okay, that's fine. The, the ring can check on the neighbors. The neighbors and those who had seen him before, who's the him? That's the guy who was blind. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar, he was begging because he was blind, that's how he made his life work, the neighbors and those who had seen him before were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And you say, well, why are they asking the question? Well, you can just imagine. If he's been healed, suddenly his whole countenance is going to look different. 
You don't behave, you don't act, you walk a little. When something of that magnitude happens, your countenance changes, the way you look and view and walk and move, you know, and, and, and your confidence, and, you know, so you're the same person, but you're a different person. Can you understand what I'm saying? Is this not the man who used to sit and bag? He kind of seems like that guy, but something's different. Verse number nine. Some said, it's him. Others said, no, but it, it looks like him. I mean, he's got the same color hair, you know. He cuts his toenails the same way, you know. I, I don't know. They have sandals. I don't know. He kept saying, the guy kept saying, I'm the man. I'm the guy. That was me. I used to be blind. Now I see. That guy is me. It's me. I'm him. Here's what I want to tell you. My life has been changed. I had a significant issue in my life, and now it's been changed. That was me. That guy you're talking about who was begging on the side and couldn't see, that was me. It's me. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. My right here, me, 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 right? Verse number 10. So they said to him, okay, if you're the guy, then how were your eyes opened? Hmm. Well, he answers, the man called Jesus, oh, that's the name we didn't want to hear. The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes with said mud and said to me, go to Siloam, which is this pool of water, and wash. So I went and washed and I received my side pack. Well, that just doesn't even make sense. Apparently, you don't know everything that's to the story. So they said, verse 12, where is he? And the guy says, I don't know. Have no idea. He put the mud on, said go, and he wasn't there when this all happened. It went down. I don't know where he's at. I, I don't know. In fact, that's a very interesting question. When, when this guy put the mud on his eyes, he didn't really understand what was going on. He didn't have a full understanding of what was happening. In fact, uh, this could have been someone just messing with a blind guy, which is going to happen from time to time. You have people who are people, and people are generally evil, right? And so every once in a while, you're going to have stuff like this happen. You don't know. It's only after the mud is gone that the real significance of Jesus becomes apparent to the man. And by this time, who knows where Jesus is? Time's gone by, I washed, all this, and, and he's gone. And if you read on later in the chapter, all the way down to the end, you'll find that the blind man, up until the point, even after he's received his sight, he's still not really put his faith in Jesus. He's had somebody put mud on his eyes, and he can now see, and he still hasn't connected totally who Jesus is yet. You'll see that if you get down to the end and read the end of the story. We're not going to deal with that tonight, but, but I'm just telling you that's the case. He's going to, to, to put his faith in Jesus later. That's what you'll see. But even before he puts his faith in Jesus, pay attention, even before he fully puts his faith in Jesus, he has no problem at all telling everyone around, I don't even know what happened, but I do know one thing. I'm the guy that was blind, and now not so blind anymore. <laughs> my life has been changed, and it, it's made a huge, my life has been changed. And so now, now in the story, if you're reading through it, an argument takes place among the Jewish leadership uh, this healing is taking place on the Sabbath, which is not good because that's work being done on the Sabbath. And, and man, Jesus is always doing stuff on the Sabbath. It's like he does it on purpose just to get in trouble, right? You've never done that before, have you? Done anything on purpose just to get in trouble? Spouses are elbowing each other. I don't know. But there's no way these Jewish leaders want to give Jesus any credit for anything good. And so they've got to find a way to discredit him. And, and they're doing anything they can to discredit his story. So they, they're pressing on with their interrogation to find something. John 9, verse 24 says, So, for the second time, they called the man who had been blind 
and said to him, and this is after they had verified that this is really the guy. They brought his parents in and said, is this the kid that's been blind since birth? Yeah, that's our son. Well, can you tell us what's happened? No, we don't know what. You know, he's old. He's old enough to tell. Ask him again. So they go and ask him again. This is what they say. They say, sir, give glory to God. And in doing this, they're trying to put pressure on him to not give glory to Jesus. Because they're the religious elite. You need to do this. Give glory to God. We know that this man, this Jesus, who you said put the mud on, on you, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. That's what the religious elites were saying. Verse number 25, the guy answers. The guy that became, who was blind and is no longer blind. He answers and he says this. Listen, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I don't really know the guy. Haven't been hanging around with him. We don't run in the same circles. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's the only thing I know here. You can ask me any other questions. Guess what? I don't have the answers. I could guess. I could make something up. I could worry that you're gonna ask me questions that I don't have the answers to. But why worry? Here's something I know. Used to be blind. Hold your fingers up. I can tell you how many you have. Because now I can see. That's the one thing I get. Verse number 26. So they said to him, well, we're gonna try this again. What did he do to you? How did he open his eyes? The previously blind fellow says, listen, I, I've told you already the answer to that, and you're, you're just not listening. Why do you want to hear the answer again? Do you want to become one of his disciples too? This is one of my favorite little stories in the Bible. In fact, this, this may literally be my favorite story in the Bible, because here we have a guy who's been blind all his life, Jesus comes along and heals him. And now, he doesn't have a long history with Jesus. He hasn't followed him like the disciples have. He's not an educated man like the Apostle Paul who could have explained the theology behind the healing. Why certain people are healed and why certain people aren't healed and why he was here. You know, the Apostle Paul could have, could have, could have explained it all out and any question they would ask Paul, Paul could have worked it out, right? Right? He didn't have any of that. He had nothing. He had no answers to anything. He had no history, no training, no anything. The one thing he's got going for him is the fact that something special has happened in his life. And the smart guys of the day come along and they try to debate with him about who Jesus is and how Jesus could do this amazing thing. But this blind guy wasn't prepared to debate. He didn't have the answers. He wasn't Paul. He only had this simple response that he could give. But it was a very powerful response. One that cannot be argued with. He said, I don't know. All I know is, I was blind, now I see. This is who I was, Jesus came into my life and made a change, and now this is who I am afterwards. That is an almost impossible argument to debate. The story of someone who says, my life used to be one way, but now because of Jesus, my life has changed in this other way. Here, here's, here's the point, here's the principle. Remember, we're talking about next steps of ways that we can love someone. Some of us here today, and if you fall in the camp of somebody who is saved, this fits you. Some of us here today, God has done some things in your life. He has changed you or he has begun a change in you in some dramatic way. And people around you, I, I promise you, can see the change. 
They don't know why. They don't know how. They, they don't know really what's happened or what's all about all of the details and all of that. But God has given you a way to take the next step, to take a next step with them. He's given you a personal story that you can share about how God changed your life. And whatever that story is, it's impossible to argue with. Now, a lot of times we worry that, that, that we're gonna share what's our testimony. A testimony is sharing something about an event that you've experienced or seen, right? Well, this is an event that you've experienced. God has done something in your life, so you share your testimony. You share your story, right? We worry that in doing that, people are gonna ask us questions that we don't have an answer to. People are gonna try to debate with us in ways that we are not prepared to debate. People are not gonna insect us in some way. This guy didn't care. All he cared about is something happened and I have no answers. I know my life used to be this way, now my life is so much better. I used to be lost, but now I'm found. This man had something dramatic happen in his life and as a result of Jesus, we don't find him going around proclaiming it to people using a megaphone. We don't find him trying to figure out the detailed theology of what happened and why it happened and, and what's around it and why does it sometimes happen and not sometimes happen and how might it have happened. He's not digging into any of that. He simply told people around him what had happened and gave witness to something that he had experienced and he attributed it to the proper source. Jesus put mud on my face, told me to go wash, and now my life's extremely different. Here, here's why I say all this. Because I believe today that there are a lot of people all around us who what they really need to hear in order for their heart to begin to become open to knowing more about God is the personal stories of someone like you about what God has done in your life. Stories like your story can be very powerful tools in taking the next step in a friendship. And not just being friends, but taking the next step in sharing God's love and God's grace with them. The next step towards, in some way, sharing who Jesus Christ is because you're sharing who Jesus Christ is in your life. Now, Here's the simple outline that we give with people to help them in this process. It's really simple. We say this. Here's how you can tell your story. It's short. It's simple. What was your life like before you came to know Christ? What were some of your struggles? What were some of your fears? What were, what were some of your worries? What were you, what, what, what were you dealing with here? Okay. Why did you come to Christ? Number three, what is your life like now? How is it different? How has your life been changed? And part of that change is always, I have a hope for eternity today, where yesterday, everything was about how this world can come to an end and a close, right? When you share your story about how Christ has changed your life, that is taking the next step, and your story is very hard to argue with. Now, let me show you just one more story from the Bible that I think is a huge practical help. And this is, we're, we're, we're just getting as practical as I can, right? This is just practice, all right? John chapter four. So this is just a few chapters earlier in the same book in the Bible. In John chapter four, Jesus has this interaction with a Samaritan woman and it's at a well where they're drawing water. And we're not gonna go through the whole story, but through the course of her conversation with, with Jesus, she comes to the point, because of, of some things that Jesus does, she comes to the place where she puts her faith, her belief in Jesus. And a little later on, she ends up off in a nearby town where she begins to tell people about her encounter with Jesus. A little bit of a testimony again here, right? Now, understand, she's only recently met Jesus. 
She doesn't have a big history. She's not educated in the scriptures. She doesn't have a lot of answers to things in life. She's, she can't be the be-all, end-all answer to whatever questions or problems that somebody may present to what she's about to do. So, what she does is she invites people from the town to go and meet the same Jesus that she met and see for themselves. Here's how that looks. John chapter four, verse 28 says this. So the woman left her water jar at the well where she had been with Jesus. And she went away into town and she said to the people, verse 29, come see a man. She's referring to Jesus. Go read the story, you'll see. Come see a man, Jesus, who told me all that I had ever done. And then she asked the question, because she doesn't know the answer. Could this be the Christ? The Christ that everybody's looking for? This was an amazing event. I, I didn't even think about it, but could this be the Christ? Verse 30. They went out of the town and were coming to him. To who? To Jesus. Pause for a second. This woman has an interaction with Jesus. The interaction with Jesus changes her entire perspective on life. So she leaves and she goes and tells some people about it and tells people, I've got questions. I don't know, lots of things, but, but you should go meet this guy that I met because there's something there. Here's the result of her invitation. Verse number 39. Many, say many. How many is many? I don't know. It's not one. It's not two. I've always been taught that many is more than three. A few is three. Many is at least four or more. I have no idea how many. You can't use the word many to define many. That doesn't work. I don't know. Whatever. All right. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I had ever did. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him, asked who? Asked Jesus. They asked Jesus to stay with him. And he, Jesus, stayed there for two days. Some of you, you've got people in your family who do not know Jesus Christ, that you would do anything if those people would ask Jesus to stay with them. Verse 41. And many more. Say many more. How many is many more? I don't know. If many is four or more, then it's got to be more than that. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, listen, it's no longer just because of what, of what you said that we believe, but now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. They've jumped from her question, could this be the Christ, to the answer, there's something big going on here. This guy is the savior of the world. This is such a powerful story. Because there's a ripple effect that takes place of so many people coming to place their faith in Jesus Christ, all because of one woman's invitation to go and meet Jesus. She didn't have any answers, but she said, I'm mad, you got, you got to meet him. I, I don't know, I don't know what to say. You got, I could try to describe him, but you got to meet him. I could try to tell you about really, and I'll tell you a little bit, but really, really this is what you do. You got to try, you got to check this out yourself. And the great thing about this is, and, and I talk about this from time to time, I believe this, this illustration, I really believe that God put on my heart to use over and over again. The great thing about this is, most of us are masters at doing what this woman just did. What do I mean? I mean, we invite people in our lives all of the time to try things that we've enjoyed to try things that have had a positive impact on us. Whether it's a restaurant that we liked, oh, you gotta you got go and try it. You gotta taste it. You know, you gotta, it's different. I mean, I know, I know that you've had that before, but Ben, it's just, it's, you gotta go. A movie that you've seen, oh, it's the funniest movie ever. Oh, it's the, I cried and I laughed, and you gotta go and see it, right? We, we do this all the time. We don't even think about it. It's just so natural. We want to tell people about things we like. We're so good at this that we invite people to try things that we don't like 
just so they can have the same experience. This smells horrible. You gotta try it, right? This is the worst tasting thing I've ever had in my life. You gotta taste it, right? And we think nothing about how they're gonna respond to that. It's this concept is built into who we are except as Christians in relation to Jesus Christ. What is that? We do this all the time, and, and I've always got to have an illustration. So uh, tonight I've got uh, uh, Pastor Sterling, who's here with us uh, live. Pastor Sterling's going to come out, and um, he's bringing with him something that I just enjoy. Uh, these are called Hershey Sunday Pies. How many of you have never had a Hershey Sunday Pie? Hershey Sunday Pies come from, from Burger King. Keep your hands up for a second. Pastor Sterling is going to go out, and he's going to hand those out here in the congregation uh, they have wrapped uh, forks and those kinds of things that are there. You're welcome to try them while you're sitting here. I know some of you are going, eating in church? <laughs> Healing on the Sabbath? I, no, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you're, welcome, you're, you're welcome to try it. Listen, if you're online tonight, we tried to do the Willy Wonka thing, you know, where we could like transport it. Didn't, didn't really work. But here's what we came up with. If you will chat in the online chat, Hershey Sunday Pie, first three people that find it, somebody, Pastor Luke and his team from our, our camp, online campus pastor, will deliver, first three people that put it in, will deliver a Hershey Sunday Pie for you this week so you can try this. We, we want you to be able to try it, okay? So, uh, but here, here's the deal. Hershey Sunday Pies, I, I, these, these have been something I have loved for a long time. I can remember back, and some of you will remember Pastor Hank Waltmeyer who was here uh, Pastor Hank and I love these things. We would go to Burger King at least three times a week, at least. We, more if I could get him, but he, he was in on it too. We would, we would both get a double cheeseburger. He would have bacon. I would not have bacon, just saying. Um, but um, a double cheeseburger, no fries, because I wanted to make room for the pie, right? Double cheeseburger, Hershey Sunday Pie, and either a Coke or a Diet Coke because there's something about the flavors of, of uh, you know, Coke. There's something like pizza and Coke. They just go together. Hershey Sunday Pie and, 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 and Coke, I don't know. It just, it just goes together. But these Hershey Sunday Pies, it's got, it's got this light, creamy, chocolatey kind of uh, flavor to them. And if you get them when they're just melted right and the crust, the crust on them is, I mean, I know they're manufacturing, but it's like homemade. You're going back to get one on your own, aren't you? Yeah, all right. Um, they're, they, are, they are simply amazing. They're amazing. Years ago on a Wednesday night, I was teaching through a portion of the Bible, and, uh, and we had, you know, maybe there was 150 or so people there, and somebody at our church was a manager at, at Burger King, and so I told them the week before, we were going to be talking about the scripture that says, taste and see that the Lord is good, and I wanted to illustrate that, so she brought me 150 Hershey Sunday pies, and we handed it out to everybody and said, oh, taste and see that the Hershey Sunday pie is good, right? Uh, but but, but here, here's what I'm saying, here's what I'm saying. I have no problem telling somebody, try a Hershey Sunday pie. Now, you may have had your hand up and were given that, and you're like, I'm not going to eat this. I'm on a diet, or I'm allergic. or I don't care. I could care less when I invite you to have it. All I care about is it's affected me in a positive way, ongoing. Uh, Pastor Steve, who got these, he got a bunch of them, and I ate one of them before the service because, you know, really, got to make sure they're good. You don't want to hand out something, you know? This is what I'm saying. I believe today that there are people all around us who what they need is an invitation to come and see themselves. Now the Samaritan woman, she invited him to go and see Jesus. Do you know what that equates to today? Jesus said, I'm gonna build the church and the church is going to be my body. I'm in heaven preparing a place for you but the church is gonna be my body and, and my representatives, my, my physical existence here on this earth. And so when we invite people here, we're inviting them to meet the body of Christ, to meet Jesus and to be impacted by Jesus. I believe today that there are people all around you who simply need an invitation. I've invited people to movies before. Some of them go, some of them don't. Nothing I can do about it, right? Same thing with you inviting somebody to church. 
Some of them are going to go. Some of them aren't going to go. I've invited some people 10 times and they didn't come to the 12th time. That's the way it's going to be with you. You're going to invite somebody 10 times and they may not come to the 20th time. It's what's going on behind the scenes of their life that affects them at those times. For many of us, this invitation thing is the next step with our friends who don't know Christ. Invite them to meet Jesus. Invite them to the church where they can interact with the body of Christ. And when they come, pray that God's spirit would speak to them and maybe even that they would come to know Jesus Christ and he would change their lives in the here and now and change their lives for all eternity. That's what it looks like practically to take the next step with a friend of yours who doesn't know Christ. Now, we're gonna close our service a little differently than we normally close our service. Be all right with that tonight because this is about different, right? I told people they could eat Hershey Sunday pies in church. So it's all right that we're doing something different. We're gonna close this this evening by celebrating what happens when all of that other practical stuff takes place and somebody puts their faith in Christ. Because tonight, we've got some people here, they're gonna be coming forward and they're gonna be celebrating Jesus Christ in their life by getting baptized. And so I'm gonna invite up tonight, Krista Ryan, who's coming out of our congregation. Krista, it's great to have you. Krista's coming and she's gonna walk around to the back of the baptism and we got some other folks after her. This is the conclusion to what can happen when we love people by doing what is next. Krista Ryan, though I accepted Christ as my savior when I was 12, I was stubborn and slow to learn obedience. I avoided fully committing myself my husband, Mike, was saved and baptized at our family's Baptist church when we were in our 20s. I didn't get baptized along with him because I thought it wasn't really important for me. For the past 25 years, I've been an occasional attendee at Crossroads and an occasional Bible reader. Then about 18 months ago, my sister, Katie, encouraged me to join my first small group with her and I somewhat reluctantly committed to a one-year Bible reading plan with her and my, and, and my husband. I began to attend church more regularly, studying and praying with a small group of believers and reading the word every day has changed me. Now I understand the importance of being baptized and committing to a church family, though God still has a lot of work to do in me. I've seen the power, the mercy, and the tender loving kindness of Christ towards me and my family throughout my life. I am so grateful to God for sending Jesus to redeem me and for being endlessly patient. From now on, like the t-shirt says, I'm all in. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's beautiful. Krista, upon your confession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Abigail Shabbat. My whole life I've known about God. My parents always made sure to tell me about all Jesus has done for me and who he is. I wasn't saved until I was around 11 years old, but I didn't fully commit until almost a year ago. I have always struggled with my mental health and have been hospitalized multiple times. I've always tried to find something to fill my void. I have participated in every program and group therapy. I have tried to everything to make myself feel okay, but nothing really seemed to work. 
I wasn't living. I was only surviving. Trusting God has changed my life, and I finally started to feel okay. I began to allow the Holy Spirit to use me to help others. I don't know where I would be if I didn't know Jesus. God has done so much in my life in such a short time. I am starting to live instead of just surviving. I am so excited to see where God will take me. And I know he has great things planned for me. Yes, he does. God has great things for you, Abigail. I'm sure of it. And it's upon your confession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior that I baptize you now in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Michael Dusu, come forward. He shares with us, I gave my life to Christ many years ago when I was 12 or 13 years old. I was very quickly overtaken by youthful passion and the desire to fit in. And having no root in myself, I slowly crept away from the light unto darkness became darker and I wanted nothing to do with God. Many years passed by, but in 2012, a friend invited me to Crossroads. I've been a regular attender ever since. When I was growing up, water baptism was not emphasized as a critical step of obedience and I did not think it was essential since I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit however looking back I realized I wasn't fully surrendered and I was giving my life to Christ pieces at a time to anyone in a similar position my advice is just surrender yes. it's much easier that way yes I am here to proclaim that I am united with him in the likeness of his death so I can be raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Hallelujah. 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 Michael, upon that beautiful confession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Jaslyn Murphy. I was raised in church here at Crossroads. I remember giving my life to Christ my first year of kids camp in second grade. As a teenager, I served and attended church regularly. I even went on life-changing missions to Guatemala. After starting college, I began experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety. I spent my time worrying about studying. I got quite sick frequently due to how stressed I was. After being forced to transfer schools due to the fact that I was a tenth of a point away from a B, I felt like a complete failure. It was the lowest I have ever been in my entire life. Putting all my faith and trust in God is the only reason I was able to recover and achieve my degree. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last year brought many ups and downs. I was blessed to be able to marry a strong Christian man. Not long after getting married, I was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis although it has been tough not a day goes by that I don't praise God my faith in the Lord has not and will not falter Hallelujah. I Hallelujah. know he will carry me through th through this like he has done in the past yes, thank you Jesus Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jaslyn, upon your confession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Eric Card. My name is Eric Card, and I'm 20 years old. I come from a Christian household and 
We've been attending Crossroads my entire life. Growing up, I attended youth group regularly and volunteered in Promised Land. After high school, I joined the Air Force and slowly started to drift away from God. I stopped attending church, reading my Bible, and even praying. Around Christmas last year, I realized I was becoming a man of the world and not of God. With help from my family, my friends, and the staff here at Crossroads, my walk with God has never been stronger, and I've given my life to Him. Eric, upon your confession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's my privilege to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Evan Carr. Evan Carr. I have always believed in God growing up in church. However, it wasn't until after I graduated high school that I really made my faith my own. At the end of 2019, I had just got out of a bad relationship. My dog died, and one of my close friends committed suicide. I felt my life going downhill. I found myself questioning my faith, and it made me search for answers. After seeking and digging into my Bible, I found that God calls us to have faith in the hardest of trials. The faith begins where understanding ends. I had faith that God was using my pain for a purpose, to further his kingdom. Going forward since, I've had a newfound joy when going through trials. There is a Bible verse that has become a rock for me. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Yes, yes, yes. Evan, that was a beautiful confession of faith. And it's my privilege now to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hooray! Praise God, praise God. That is life change, amen? That is life change. Can we stand to our feet and give God some worship, some praise? Listen, if you're here today and you're saying, man, God can't do this at me. Maybe you've, you've even tried faith and you're saying, man, it's been years since I felt God's hand on me. Listen, did you hear those stories? That's our God. He sent His only begotten Son so we can know Jesus Christ. That's our God. That's our God. That is reason to worship. That is reason to praise. God is good. God is faithful. That is reason to share. That's what Pastor Sean's saying. We have something that will change someone's life, not just for today, not for tomorrow, but say it, for eternity. Eternity, amen? And so we're gonna do in a moment, I'm gonna close this out in prayer, but right now we are gonna worship together. We're gonna praise God, not just for these stories, the things he's done in our lives. And as you're praising, I want you to think about lives, family members, neighbors, coworkers, and I want you to think of what Jesus is going to do in their life and how he's going to use you. Amen. Let's worship. Let's worship. Amen.
somebody to crossroads you're gonna say hey come and even go a little further and say I will meet you there I'll sit with you we are what we are family God has called us and we're gonna have some of our elders deacons come up and I want to say I heard Pastor Sean say this question where he was we were kind of reflecting back on who we were where we were at some of you right now are saying I need Jesus I need to rededicate my life. I need to take a step forward. Did you see the boldness it took for them to come up? Y'all think, oh, that was easy. No, it's a lot of courage and boldness to step out. And so as we close, come and talk with someone. If it's, I want to know more about Jesus, I have a prayer request. Pray with one of our leaders. But invite somebody next weekend. Amen? Father's Day weekend. Invite somebody. Get them in here. As you're leaving, I'm going to encourage you, stop at Connection Point. We have some people who would love to meet you, love to help you find a place to serve. Get connected. Stop and talk with us. We love you. The Taste of East Hartford starts tomorrow through Thursday. So go to those restaurants and love on them. Amen. If you want to hear more, stop at Connection Point. Praise God. You are dismissed. We love you. And just continue that spirit of inviting evangelism. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us this weekend in our online service. If you are ready to continue responding to God, there's just a one simple thing I would ask. If you could text BEGIN to 80123. Someone will follow up with you, hear more about the next steps that you're ready to take, and give you guidance on where to go from here. Again, we're so glad to be with you, and we look forward to being with you in person in this room. Thanks. God bless.